Oh yeah, so I think most of us are here, so we'll kick off, and if the person we need to talk gets in here, we'll go back to them. Um, so this is basically the session where we all come back and we report on the cool unconferency stuff that we've just been doing for the rest of the afternoon. And um, you get to stand up for two minutes if I call you. Tell me about the unconference session and tell everyone else about the unconference session. And if no one wants to stand up in the session, whoever it works the session gets to stand up and talk for two minutes. So there's no getting out of it. Um, there are 11 presentations. There are, there are 11 unconference sessions today, which means that we are going to keep people to two minutes a, uh, a presentation absolute maximum. So when I call you, please stand up where you are. Don't bother coming to the front. And just speak for two minutes. Easy, right? We're academics. We can do this. Um, so the first one we have is how to speak up for equality and diversity without being that person. Who's so standing up for that? You have two minutes on equality and diversity. It was that person in air quotes. Um, and one of the things that we talked about was how everyone kind of responded to, to this. It was like, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. But actually, everyone has a sort of slightly different definition of what it means to be that person and what the consequences are of being that person. Generally, uh, negative consequences, so being ignored, um, being sidelined, being pigeonholed, um, but ways you can stop being that person or, or just approach it in a completely different, in a completely different manner. Um, one of the main things that um, like you can for equality and diversity more effectively if you're in a privileged group, whatever that may be, because um, your voice is a bit louder in that group. Um, so I could be as a straight female, for example, a straight white female. I could speak up for LGBT rights. I could speak up for diversity in the racial, you know, cultural mixes or religion. Um, but it's possible that depending on the room I'm in, if I'm speaking up for gender equality, that it's going to be harder to do the contribution. Uh, so everybody has a different contribution to make. Um, we should speak about everything. White males get to speak up about just about anything they like. Um, but <laughs> but we did uh, we did smart. talk about different ways in which the person you think is the privileged group actually isn't. Um, so there are some situations where men have a harder time, and so uh, in that we can you know we can all find a common ground and meet in some in some respects. And it was pointed out that there was a couple of things that, for example. Uh, some people felt that being really, really passionate is a way to turn people off. So you should try to be sort of civilized, have a nice discourse, and not be accusatory, and and just be unbiased. That tends to go out in science. Um, and okay, I'll just stop from yeah. time. Okay. All right. <laughs> that was two, two minutes, uh, and that's how savage I'm going to be. Um, <laughs> yeah. Astro query, WebDB querying tools based on AstroPy. Who's standing up for that? 
So Azure Query is a toolkit based on Azure Pi and it's based on a few success approach, just examples. And uh, everybody in session was able to install it. There were only a few small hiccups, mostly related to the like, for software being on the machine. So um, in short, it's for query tools like SIPAD, here, any kind of catalog that has a web interface. And it's being beta released now. So um, if anybody wants to load in the session, feel free to download it, try it out. Um, post plug reports, we're encouraging that because we've got some use in session. And uh, yeah, give it a shot. Wow, we're a minute and 30 seconds ahead of time. This is going well. <laughs> OK, outreach in public settings, science festivals, museums, planetariums. How do we measure the impact? And apparently, we have no answers. Do you now have answers? Uh, we have a plan. Yeah, a plan. Okay. Um, so we had a very lively discussion on the challenges of measuring impact in outreach work. Um, so first, we talked about what are the goals of outreach. So do we want to inform people? Do we want to inspire people? Jonathan Fay had the most memorable quote of the session, which was his goal was to get people to say, oh my god, in a non-sexual context. <laughs> 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 Um, if people feel satisfied or positive about the experience, that they didn't actually learn anything, is that a good thing? Is that enough? Um, we talked about whose goals do we care about? Are we trying to evaluate things so we can improve our own work? Or are we trying to get data for funding agencies to justify why they're using this money? Um, okay, so we talked about different methods. Um, so if you're in um, a museum or a sanitarium, you can use poker chips, you can use iPads to get people to vote on different questions. Um, a very popular um, idea was from Erin and the Black Hole exhibit of the Science Education Department at the CFA. Um, they have little tickets that you get when you come to the exhibit, and um, it keeps track of all the things you did at the exhibit, and then you go home, and you have your own personal website that was built from all the things that you did. So this is a really um, powerful way to incentivize getting people to come back and give you information, I don't know how much time do I have. 32 seconds. 32 seconds, OK. Um, we talked about online tools that we can passively mine. Finally, we created a plan to do a hack session tomorrow to create a standardized bank of common survey questions that would be across a wide variety of goals so that if everyone uses them, we'll get a statistical sample of outcomes in different settings, what environments are conducive to getting the best outreach results. Um, and Okay, uh, and next up we have Jonathan, how to build a killer astronomy show with WWT. Okay, well you're making me feel like a pie maker from pushing daisies. If I go over two <laughs> minutes, someone with random proximity will die. Um, <laughs> and that would be killer. Yeah, so um, we're uh, demonstrating uh, authoring tours and a telescope. We're showing the different targets, the types of things, um, being able to do for like flat panel for regular WWT you know, on desktop and notebooks, as well as deploying over the web. But then we were talking about uh, now anybody can just download a little telescope and actually create full dome shows or uh, shows for um, movie theaters, stereo, things like that with the authoring tools. We walked through, we built a, a simple tour of which I made a ham of myself narrating it to show how auto it's recording could be um, uh, integrated with that. Um, we are about to show Amanda's uh, um, and Mark Subarau's work on the Dirty Space News show for Adler. Unfortunately, I hadn't downloaded that yet, uh, and we didn't get to it. But um, tomorrow at the uh, half day, I will be glad to help out with any technology integrating Worldwide Telescope uh, into projects for uh, you know shows, websites, data visualization, and uh, using kiosk type stuff like that. I'll be game to help out anyone who would like to use that. Thank you, Jonathan. And if anyone hasn't gone and played with the Oculus Rift, with the Worldwide oh, Telescope, yeah. for the love of God, go and do it. It's awesome. Um, yeah. It's in a non sexual context. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the next one. <laughs> <laughs> He's even getting flushed. Uh, uh, digital education. MOOCs. Ow. Who? So we had a, a session on digital education and MOOCs, so massive open online courses. Uh, from memory, I think it was about 25 years 
Um, so we discussed many things about uh, what was important for in small groups. So for example, we talked about the language support, how you use small packages and focus on modularity uh, versus continuity as a, as a loop. Um, we talked about how it shouldn't be just about referencing different materials, but also about interpreting materials and learning from it. Uh, we talked about talking heads versus uh, so talking heads in the sense of a course versus interactive tools and exercises. Uh, about the people, the scientists could be content providers for the loop uh, versus the education researchers and how these two populations could have different goals in terms of the group. We talked about the importance of language, not just focusing on the English language group. Uh, also about the different distribution platforms that we could have, apps versus the internet uh, versus using this existing platforms. And in the end, uh, something that we mentioned several times that we should just start organically and just go out there and do it. Uh, so th with that in mind, uh, we can have a half year project on uh, different education groups uh, and have two kind of projects. One would be to collect people's favorite websites and material as they reference them. And the other one would just go out there and do it and start building some topic head types uh, and add some interactive tools and exercises later. Thank you. Okay, uh, so next we have um, Share the love, a fair credit system for astronomy. And, yeah, that, that was the session I proposed. Um, so, so the basis of this discussion was that um, if we kind of accept that there are uh, people in the community who want very simplified metrics to measure what an important scientist's contribution is to research, um, can we make that a fairer metric than um, citation counts or publication counts? <coughs> I think most of us agree are kind of incredibly crude and not very relevant. Um, so that would be the sort of thing that's kind of based in uh, that um, maybe using uh, latex, uh, latex macros or things like that. So where, where we kind of get slightly <coughs> beyond uh, audit contribution. Um, but the discussion kind of, uh, I guess, a good summary would be that, that we want to build a kind of astronomer who we. Um, and the strongly equivalent of the internet movie database, and this is where a lot of people end up sort of quite agreeing on, that it's really great to, you can, you know, you look up Robert Simpson, and then there are all sorts of... <laughs> In a non-sexual context. <laughs> 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 oh, God, no. <laughs> User astro exploration experiences with group collaboration once? That didn't happen. Didn't happen? No? Okay. Still happens. Still. Okay. Linking astronomy literature to popular literature. All right, so I, I created this one. It, it's actually kind of connected to what Sarah was talking about with uh, credit in, uh, in astronomy. But this is more of a farm brain example of. Uh, something that I harass public about all the time about trying to see, you know, say, wouldn't it be great if somehow they cited properly in press releases uh, the actual paper, you know, well, or like, could we somehow enhance the user experience in the ADS of using the popular literature and the news and press releases as sort of a gateway into the ADS and, and vice versa of trying to use this uh, credit? But then it, in the end, I got sort of shut down, that uh, uh, the culture would be hard to change, um, you know, like could we provide some kind of uh, useful information for people building press releases on how to cite things properly and make these connections. Um, and then, so in the end, we kind of just, just dovetailed into talking about um, just projects that are already, already happening 
as far as with credit, like altmetric.com. And uh, something that came up too was uh, ScienceWise, another project that people didn't know too much about, and ORCID, uh, O-R-C-I-D. Uh, <laughs> I sing a song for that. But about how to uh, get credit for these particular things. So it kind of really fed into what Sarah was talking to too about as well. So that's it in a nutshell. What is the future of astronomy figures in astro literature? All right, so I wanted to have this session because I found myself really interested in the New York Times website and not doing my work. And it was because the New York Times website has this beautiful interactive figure that allowed me to both see a story on the data figure um, and show the data and explore the data in an interactive way. Um, whereas my figures sucked and I couldn't get them. And even as hard as I tried, there were these static things that didn't let people to explore and play with the data. So I realized that we wanted to have something like that. Um, and I showed a couple of, of stats that I had taken at this, um, both that had actually been published and then things that were just kind of kicking around my website, um, and wanted to get people's ideas on things. And so we sort of came up with a bunch of different tensions. Um, I don't think we came up with the answers, but at least we came up with some questions. Um, so one tension is the tension between the idea that figures really can't currently be embedded in, in current paper PDFs. They don't have limitations. Um, but there's a tension between that and maybe we should push forward because interactive figures can help drive the future of scientific publishing. Uh, or uh, things like that where um, definitely uh, JavaScript and so forth can be embedded. Um, so maybe this we shouldn't be looking at the past, but looking at the future. Um, Another question is whether, if we want to push forward on something like this, do we want to push mostly on culture or on technology? Um, the point was made at one hand with you know, a simple Google Doc actually make an interactive figure, and maybe it's not the most beautiful thing, and maybe it's not perfect, and maybe it doesn't do everything we want, but maybe it's really the culture that needs to be moved forward. Um, on the other hand, if we want to do something, we want to make a figure that people can use, we need it to be relatively flexible, and so maybe we really need some smart undertaking on culture. Um, um, and then more sort of a detailed question. Do we need a code that's going to make these figures be powerful at many um, hundreds of thousands to billions of points? We know these big surveys are going to have a lot of data in them. Um, and if you use what people use in the New York Times, that can't be extended to, to um, billions of points. Um, is that really important? Or is it more important that it work with people's current workflow? Um, that it be able to work with Python or more apes, I don't know what people use. But do we need some kind of code that plays on that nicely? I'm going to shut you down. Great. OK, um, transition into industry leaving the ivory tower. Caroline and I run the session on this, so as I'm standing here, Caroline. OK, um, so it was, it was a good session. Yeah. Some bullet points, uh, feedback. So things that were highlighted were the importance of side projects and networking outside of academia to look against the transition industry. Uh, Academics need to realize that the skills of academics are real skills. And there was a really good example about paper authorship, like a lead author is actually managing a team. So it's just different words for, for, for someone who's doing academia and the industry we actually call it teamwork. And that was different sounds. Um, so you sort of need to be able to speak industry. And then the question was, wait, how can we get help for that? Um, and so then there were a couple of things that we did. Could you go and, and things like that? So that's good. So there is there is resource, there are resources out there. Then um, it was it was nice to hear success stories, but then there was a question about what, what's the average, you know, when you leave academia, what's the average? You know, where do you end up? And that's actually a big question. We don't know, nobody's tracking these people, so maybe we should start doing that. Then uh, it was highlighted that um, tech companies are very willing to hire, you know, academics or leaving academics, recovering academics, whatever you want to call it. So whether fresh out of grad school or within 10 years in an academic career. So that's, I mean, good hope for us, right? Um, and, uh, writing is a very good skill that we work on in academia, and, and it's not always, you know, for an undergraduate when you're looking for jobs elsewhere. It's, it's very so, so then there was a mention, of course, of software testing and having a definitely recognized in industry. Um, and then also within sort of the academic system, there are jobs that are not the tenure path and so on and so on. But um, so, so there are possibilities, but some of them are on the brink of extinction, like um, the things like that. Um, so the question then has raised are there half the houses that way you can do in the industry? Is it not just in 
using the Galaxy 2 or the, the previous upgrades and um, how to find your LinkedIn um, and date science conferences and insight in the Okay, so that was the last of the unconference sessions that I know about. Did anyone else have an There's a hand going up there. Does, does anyone else have an unconference session I don't know about? You. We have time left. We have as much as five minutes in the well, Slack and the session. Two minutes then. On whatever it was you were talking about. So we were talking about indexing uh, all the measurements in the literature. And the idea, for example, that you could find every measurement that exists for your planet or your star or um, all the secondary eclipse depths that have ever been measured within a certain wavelength range for some exoplanets or whatever. Um, to different types of projects, but, but very similar in that what you're trying to do is mine numbers out of the literature. Um, we talked about uh, infrastructure that will start to put together tomorrow with the hack day, so whatever is in that will join us um, with a, uh, basically a simple input into a database a way of browsing the data, which is a way of getting data out of it. We talked about citizen science for populating this initially, and then how we might hopefully grow that to the point where when we submit a paper, we also have to submit an entry file to get uh, your measurements that are in your paper into the database. Um, we talked about similar projects that are uh, underway elsewhere or places where this is talked about. We talked about vetting the data and needing a gateway and gatekeeper to make sure that all the good data gets in. Um, Thank you. Um, anyone else? Is there anything else that we didn't know about? Chris? Um, I got distracted on the way to a session, so I talked to Hog, who's somewhere. Um, but we, we had a brief discussion about, um, as a step towards modeling astronomers in the exoplanet space, um, trying to identify using the existing data places where your intervention had biased the sample, and we're going to try and come up with an idea for doing that sometime in the next couple of days. So this is a member for anyone who wants um, to write a quick and hacky paper uh, on that to come by neither of us. So we'll call it a session. It was a conversation. Yeah. yeah, you're allowed to have those too. <laughs> um, okay, so if there's no one else, then we will uh, crack on. Okay, do, just before Alberto steps up, I just wanted to quickly go through how the hack day works tomorrow, because this will be the last chance to have you all be more tentative a screener. Um, so let's just jump ahead and back to the hack day bit. There. So uh, in the morning, we will have some quick pitches, uh, which will work much like that session just worked, uh, where you will uh, be queued up here and, and come and tell everyone your idea. And so that will be in the bit leading up to the morning coffee, as it was time this morning. After, yes? What is the time limit? I mean, is it going to be uh, the time limit will depend on how many of you there are, but I imagine it's going to be a minute or something. So, yeah. On the website, there are like 27 minutes. Yeah, it's going to be quick. So. Um, then, then we will start coffee, uh, and then you are just off, and you have the space to use all day. Um, lunch and coffee will be served as normal. We're going to have some food coming in the evening. Uh, and you can literally stay here all the way through till the start of play on Wednesday morning if you want to. Um, we will report will we back on Wednesday morning, and there's a session for reporting. Sorry? Will we be able to enter the building late at night? I believe so. Yeah, we, we have a security person downstairs who will manage. Well, uh, yeah. I think so, yeah. Uh, we paid extra for that. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah. So we'll then report back on Wednesday morning with the results of hacks. Uh, although, of course, if you want to sort of write something up and put it on a blog post, unless you can point people to it on Wednesday, that would also work as well. Um, and the rules apply like if you join conference sessions on a hack day, you should leave. If you're, I'll reiterate all this tomorrow morning, but leave if you join groups, ask for people's help. You've got the participants at astronomy.com mailing list, which everyone can post to, as well as receive email from. Um, and of course, you're supposed to have fun as well. So I'll reiterate that in the morning, uh, but I think it was worth pointing out how it will work, because uh, you, know, you want to go to bed tonight. My best, guys. Good rest. And, <laughs> and, and have a cool idea for tomorrow. So, yeah, yeah, talk about it at the pub tonight. Well, yeah, yeah pub's good, but yeah. Cool <laughs> your energy, basically. Um, yes, I'm going to hand over to you. So. Albert, do you have your own computer? Yeah, I should okay. have 
Yeah. Uh, so um, my name is um, my name is Gus Minch, uh, uh, Twitter handle um, uh, August Minch, and I'd like to uh, just take a moment to thank everyone for coming. I think it was the only time I get up in front of all of you um, as sort of the the lead uh, uh, local organizer for this meeting. Um, we tend to focus on catering and things like that. So, um, but I did tonight. I get to introduce uh, uh, Alberto Akamazi, who's the program manager for the NASA. Um, the Smithsonian NASA Astrophysics Data Service, which we all know we use on a daily basis in astronomy, is easily one of the more commonly used uh, uh, tools uh, for our research. Um, a few things that you might not know about um, Alberto: uh, he has been um, with uh, at the Smithsonian and with NASA ADS for almost 20 years. Uh, of course, uh, ADS was released before the web was, or essentially simultaneous with, with the web. Um, and so uh, he um, is, has, has gone from originally working on uh, data, uh, uh, imaging data um, uh, at, the, at the Australian, to working on data as literature in, in bibliometric, and also returning the data term back to the NASA Astrophysics Data Service. And his talk is going to be the dot Astrophysics Data Service. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything else. System. The system. All right, thank you guys. Thanks everyone. Um, this is very exciting for me. Um, I um, so when I heard that Dot Astronomy was coming to town, this being a conference that I tried to follow remotely for a few years, uh, but never being able to attend it, I was excited and I figured I wanted to come and hear what um, all the buzz was about. Um, and then Robert sent me an email and say, "How about getting a, a keynote?" speech, and I'm like, wait a minute, I, I wasn't fully prepared for that. And so um, so the question came to my mind about what can I tell this crowd of talented and young people about a service which was described recently in a tweet as antiquated but essential. Uh, so I took that as a compliment. Um, still quite popular despite um, as Gus said, it was originally conceived in uh, around 1989-1990. Um, we recently celebrated the so-called ADS 20-year anniversary uh, because in 1993, actually when we rolled out the what has become the current ADS, which is a bibliographic service, um, originally the ADS itself was uh, conceived as a data service, sort of a mini VO in a box. Um, Anyway, so I thought the best use of my time here, and um, also the uh, one of the goals that would be nice to have out of this talk and the rest of the meeting is describe the process through which the ADS is kind of reinventing itself, um, going from this well-known service to something which is uh, more of a platform and, and you know more of a modern uh, discovery engine for our community. So. I will briefly discuss a little bit uh, about the architecture and technologies that we're using now. So we're saying we're building out um, a bunch of new functionality. I will attempt at least to give a demo of uh, the very recent uh, services that we just deployed. And then I'll try to conclude with uh, kind of a lessons learned, a um, few slides, um, and also relate um, some of the things that we've been thinking about as in terms of future directions to uh, some of the conversations I've heard at this conference. Um, so starting from the beginning, um, if you ask a, an astronomer um, or even more, a librarian to say what ADS is, they will tell you that it's a disciplinary repository. It's the official term. It's, it's a place where um, you have information related to um, digital library related to a certain discipline. In our case, it's astronomy, but um, not only astronomy, we're uh, increasingly collecting information about papers in physics, and um, you know, especially high energy physics, the field of cosmology is expanding both in astronomy and, and physics uh, quite rapidly. Um, so we provide all kinds of services, um, the ones you're familiar with, search the literature, use citations, um, that we go beyond just the, the papers itself, themselves, uh, into connected to data sets. 
And then, um, as you well know, we offer uh, ways to compute metrics based on this content, um, provide notifications. Um, we just hit the 10 million record mark recently. Um, and in fact, it's only, I mean, argue these papers that are astronomy related. There's about 2 million papers in astronomy. And that gives you a, a sense of how much bigger physics really is and how it's now represented in ADS. Um, we have more than 60 million citations. So these were uh, pairs of citing and cited paper. Um, so th these are citations that we were able to identify in our system. And uh, we now have well over 2.5 million full text documents, which are indexed in our system. And I'll, I'll, in my demo, I'll show you how that works in the current system. Um, we think we have full penetration in our community and beyond. Um, there's uh, more than 50,000 regular users, and um, I probably guess there's not these many professional astronomers in the world. So uh, we're used by more than just astronomers. Um, and if you count the total amount of people on a yearly basis, it's about 10 million uh, total visitors to our website. And um, our metadata is indexed um, uh, beyond um, beyond our system, all the search engines index the major search engines is the index of metadata. Uh, I just recently found and found that there's more than 75,000 links from Wikipedia to ABS data. So, so this is actually a great way um, to see how our work is being used by um, by other systems. I won't go through the entire 20-year history, um, but um, since there's many young faces here. Just wanted to remind you that in '93, um, our system was launched, and at that time it was kind of a big deal. Um, it was an internet-based uh, service, and it, um, even though it wasn't on the web originally, it was already connected to the Simbad object database. So you could already do a search uh, of the literature and combine it with an object search in '93. <clears throat> in '95. We actually went ahead and digitized the Astrophysical Journal letters. That was the same year when uh, um, the journal itself started e-publishing online. So AES scanned the historical literature, and then um, the AAS put the new papers in AFG letters online. So we had a continuous coverage of the Astrophysical Journal letters. 97. We incorporated Archive, um, which was becoming um, a major uh, source of papers for astronomy. Uh, and then we started working on citations. At the time, it wasn't clear how uh, how much interest there might be in finding um, the working astronomers in uh, uh, looking at citations. But it quickly became clear that this was uh, something very interesting. Um, and on we go. In 2003, we launched our notification service. Um, we started incorporating uh, full text content in the ADS. Um, we uh, provide a logging system now, uh, which is paired up with the notifications that you can get. Um, in uh, 2000, end of 2010, early 2011, we launched what some of you may have seen, ABS Labs, which is a new platform which I will describe, and then um, uh, added to it uh, through the um, addition of metrics and visualizations based on um, the ABS corpus and the bibliographic information which uh, we collect. And here we are today with 60 million citations and 10 million records. Um, oh, this, this website at the bottom actually, it, uh, it's a little um, um, WordPress website that we set, uh, set up for our 20th anniversary. But uh, there's a very nice talk by Christine Boardman um, about the uh, ADS and the astronomy community um, in this age of the internet. Um, it's one hour long, but it's well worth listening to it if you're interested in this. Way. So what is it that we do? Our basic business is taking the scientific paper and kind of deconstructing it, um, turning it into machine-readable object, and then using um, all of this information for indexing, discovery, et cetera. So if you look at a paper like this, um, our job is to actually um, breaking it apart, uh, identifying all the fields, um, uh, turning the text into um, you know, an actual uh, blob in our database, um, extracting references, 
uh, acknowledgments, and then uh, creating a record that is indexed in our system, and uh, which has this god awful look on our website, um, very 1990s, um, still uh, the kind of style that we're using in ABS Classic, but I'll show you how it's about to change. Uh, all of the things which are highlighted here in color are searchable, so if we make it possible for people, for people to find the um, information of interest to them. But we don't stop here. We're not just recreating uh, something out of the um, electronic journal. We, we um, aggregate additional information. So we link to different resources, including the archive version of a paper. If there's um, uh, if you have a library linking service, then we allow you to have access to them. We link to uh, data products, um, uh, which may be at other astrophysics archives. We link to astronomical objects that have been curated by Simba or Man. And um, in its, essentially what we do is we act as an aggregator of content, uh, and we link it to the literature. So we get our source from um, different bibliographic sources, uh, starting from the publishers, but other um, places like Crossref and Simbed. We merge that information with the archive preprint. Um, you probably, you might appreciate the fact that um, when, we, when you look at citations of one of your papers, we count not just the citations made to the published paper, but also the citations made to the preprint. So you, you get a holistic view of that work. Um, and then we link to uh, archives, the uh, Simbed, the Zier. Um, we use text mining techniques to um, enhance what we have already. Um, important for housekeeping pur purposes is that we keep track of where everything comes from. And um, we include bibliographies that are generated by our collaborators. So the classic system that many of you are familiar with, as I said, it's, um, it's built on software which is at least 15 years old. And it was built because when we started out on our project, there was nothing that we could use um, the, uh, out of the box. So um, relational database uh, management systems uh, were expensive and were limited in capabilities. Um, the, uh, there was no open source uh, SQL engine. Uh, it was costly and hard to administer um, for purpose of, uh, of our application. So we ended up right, rolling our own uh, system, um, mostly written in uh, C, um, about 250,000 lines of C code, um, and then just as many in uh, uh, C, Perl, and Python, which, uh, which make up the, the workflow and ingest pipeline into the system. And this created a big problem. Um, uh, which became apparent several years ago, which is uh, we had this organic growth of a system where new features were added, but there was no clear architecture or um, documented uh, components that could be replaced easily. Lots of intellectual property uh, was locked into the code. People wrote the code, moved on, no documentation, not a pretty picture. Um, so what we did was we started out as kind of an experiment, which we called ADS Labs, um, a new platform which was built on the existing search engine um, and which we launched in, um, in 2010, or just uh, late 2010. Um, what we included uh, were options to filter searches uh, using so-called facets, and, um, but, and also search the full text that we uh, had been accumulating. We introduced the visualizations over this data, uh, provided recommendations. It was built using a simple stack that was um, seemed like a good choice at the time. It's all Python with the web PY, um, style sheets, and jQuery. Um, so this provided a platform that allowed us to uh, conduct some experiments and then kind of sketch out what the long-term architecture of our system would be. Um, which uh, we, we're, which is the core of our work right now. It's it's a system which is built on um, open source components. There's three main parts of it. One is the Invenio platform, which is uh, open source uh, digital library platform developed at CERN. 
and used by the high energy physics uh, bibliographic system called INSPIRE. Um, there's then uh, Solar and Lucene, which are products of the Apache Foundation. Um, so these are widely used, uh, the widely used search engine. It's all written in Java, uh, more than 250,000 lines of code. And then uh, MongoDB is a document database, so it's a no, no SQL database, um, which uh, matches well our uh, document model because you, you, you don't need to store things in uh, rows and columns, but it's based on a, um, a JSON structure um, that can take any form and a JavaScript engine on top of it. So this is what um, I cleverly named the Dot Astrophysics Data System, trying to come up with a clever name for my talk. But uh, we call it ADS 2.0 internally. And um, the rest of the world hasn't really seen it yet. We've put out some, um, uh, some services that uh, are deploying little bits and pieces of it. Um, but as of last Friday, we've actually rolled out enough um, functionality that we're ready to let people have a go at it. Um, the exciting things uh, from our perspective are pretty much the ones that are listed here. It's, um, it's built on some solid uh, web and digital library standards. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we have a new search engine. Um, what I should mention is that we've not only taken the basic functionality, but we're expanding its capabilities. So that there's a formal grammar that describes the kind of searches you can do. And I'll show you some examples of that. And operators that you can apply to your searches. Um, there is a public API that um, we have now released, which uh, also uses the same search engine. And um, because of uh, requirements with uh, uh, since it involves content that is given to us by the publishers, um, we can allow different um, levels of access control over this content. Um, I'll show you what we're doing in terms of um, building on top of this to create uh, visualizations, uh, search, export, etc. And um, all of this is done in a collaborative way. Everything that we're writing is on GitHub. And uh, as I said, all the components are open source. So I invite any of you hackers to take a look at what we're doing, help us do it better. Um, and longer term, we would like this to be a platform for other people to participate in. So if people are interested in um, uh, searching and curating data that is locked up in papers, you know, we're here to help you with. Uh, the transitions of technologies, um, as I tried to summarize it here, basically, um, we went to some uh, custom-based uh, uh, metadata um, tagging to standards such as MARC, which is a um, library standard. And probably, we're going to go to something called BitFrame or some um, you know, more modern uh, system. Um, you can see how we're moving to more web-friendly platforms in terms of uh, formats, so JSON, um, as opposed to a, a XML or HTML. The search paradigm may be the most interesting part of it is that uh, ADS, the ADS Classic has also always been built around the idea that you do a search, you look at your results, and you realize that you want to search a little differently, so you go back. You uh, refine your search by adding some components and get more results. Um, in the new system, we want you to uh, be able to do this much more interactively and also discover content, uh, structure metadata as you do your search. So that's what um, we call here facets. It's filters that allow you to refine your search iterate in an iterative way. Um, and the, uh, the stack that we're using is basically Flask, which is a Python framework, jQuery. Uh, bootstrap and uh, D3, et cetera, et cetera. Let me um, just quickly illustrate. Um, I don't want to take all the time. So this is ADS Classic. Most of you must have seen this. This was ADS Labs. Um, so simplified our search, one box, uh, a few modes to search. And this is the new system. It's, um, it's Bootstrap, so it has this particular look. But uh, we reduced the number of, of um, things of options that you have. And you can do just about everything on the command line. List of results in ADS Classic, 
rows and columns. Um, here we have uh, some rows, but you have filters on the left, which are computed on the top and in results. And here now we have um, an integrated search of the full text, the metadata with filters on the left, which are computed over the entire collection of results. Adios Classic shows you a paper like this, with that huge list of affiliations. Um, Adios Labs started to um, use the real estate a little better, and we're moving in the same direction right now. So you have main metadata plus um, related resources on links and tabs and so on. ADS Classic and metadata in a custom tag format. Um, ADS Labs uh, was using the XML from the search engine. And now, as I said, we're moving to JSON um, in ADS 2.0. So here, if you can see advice, I'm going to attempt a live demo. And a little Many of the features I'll show that literally being released last week, so um, anything and everything can go wrong with this one. Nothing can go wrong. Uh, okay, thank you. So is um thing is David Monster? I need it too. Okay. <laughs> So I needed to find an accomplished sign just to use the test for um, changing this functionality. So I just searched for a hog. And the first thing you'll notice is that the system doesn't just do a metadata search, but I'm finding a lot of hits, as you can see, um, in the full text. So people mentioning David in, their, in his papers or referencing him. What do you the font, David? Um, yes, font paper. Except we might lose some. Um, you can play along the time. You can just do it yourself. Right? <laughs> yes. As you do. You can. Okay, let, let me do this. Uh, I think. <laughs> okay, but so, so instead of now forcing me to go back, or first of all, I could refine my query up here. I could um, click on author just to make it. Or I can see this filter right here that tells me, hey, one of the, many of the papers, in fact, 145 papers that you're interested in. Um, actually have an author whose name is Fox, so maybe I want to filter by doing this. So I added this uh, constraint that says author must be hog common D. Um, or I could have um, just opened up this list and see that all the different ways in which um, hog D appears in the literature and in fact find out that, well, there's more than one hog D that I'm interested in and I believe um, our Astro Hall is DW, so it's David W, or possibly D. And now I can say, okay, I want to OR all of these options and rerun the query. So you see how I'm rather refining the results by this. Of course, I could, have, I could have also said, no, I'm using deeper. Um, and I know the name of that person, and so I'm going to just search for this person um, directly. And so um, let's see what is most uh, cited papers are. Um, and it turns out that, okay, it looks like you worked on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Those are highly cited, highly cited papers, and um, they're all over. Um, you know, once I re-rank the list by citations, that those are the papers that come out first. But maybe I'm interested to see what else he did. The Sloan is a big project, so he's one of many people that have been involved in there. Um, so let's take away the Sloan papers. I'm going to say minus Sloan in my query and get back a list. So um, let's then resort by citation again. So here are dated, most cited papers uh, without the Sloan papers included in the set. Um, and what I could do, among the other things, is uh, if I'm interested to see uh, what um, grants have been used. Um, so one of the facets we provide um, 
which we built with collaboration from our uh, library, actually, are facets that uh, correlate grants to papers. So I could, uh, for instance, observe that um, this particular, um, say, grant given by NASA has been mentioned in 11 of the papers that um, David wrote. And by clicking this, um, I'm finding what those 11 papers are. So I'm looking at the impact of a single grant over the papers written by a particular person. And now I could, for instance, uh, look at the um, impact of these papers by generating metrics over them. Um, so if I were interested in answering the question, what impact has this grant had? Um, well, here it is, right? Um, it, we have statistics over the citations. There's been uh, uh, 158 uh, referee citations, so all the papers that were written as a result of that grant. And you can uh, get histograms about usage, um, referee versus non-referee papers, um, a breakdown of citations per year, etc. Is that just uh, US or just scrape that information? US scrape the information? I'm sorry, what's the Is question? Just US grants. So far, we've only, um, so this is. This is gen uh, information that we generate. It's not given to us by the publishers or any other thing. So we have right now scraped uh, NASA grants from 1995 to date. Um, uh, quick scrape of the NSF astronomy grants and um, uh, the um, Department of Energy, uh, which are not included in here yet. Uh, we are going to give it another pass. We now receive some funds from NASA to do this better with human validation as opposed to scraping. Um, and we'll, we'll explain in detail what has been uh, validated and what hasn't been. But so you're not just taking it from the acknowledgement of the community paper? No, but I'm glad you asked. Um, you can do that, actually. So if I have this grant number here, we now as best as we can, we, we started uh, indexing the acknowledgement section. So if you know the field, which is ACK, then you can put in any string to search uh, what uh, appears in the acknowledgement section. Um, so now I did a broad search um, by looking at how this string appears, how often this string appears in uh, the acknowledgement section of any papers, and we found 29 results. Um, again, the original list we were looking at were David's papers that have acknowledged this grant, so there's many more that um, acknowledge the grant. Um, again, this is not necessarily a complete search. It may be that in some cases uh, we haven't been able to um, identify the acknowledgement sections, so it may be easier to do a full text search where you find uh, this string uh, appearing across uh, in the body of any paper. Um, let me continue, though. Um, of course, one of the things you could do is um, do a topic search. So um, if I search for galaxy clusters, galaxy clusters, or I may want to search for um, clusters of galaxy. And um, get a sense of um, um, sense of what's in our database. So I find a lot of papers. 32,000 32, papers talk about, uh, contain one of these two terms. Now, in some cases, obviously, since the search includes the full text, um, there may be a mention of clusters of galaxies, but it, it, it's probably it may not be the um, main topic of the paper. So one thing I can easily do by opening this option is disable uh, the full text search, which means we are conducting a search just on the basic metadata, what ADS Classic has always done. And so now I'm going to find basically um, uh, cluster mentions of clusters of galaxies in, um, in the title or in the abstract. And again, I could uh, resort by citation numbers, for instance, um, to get a shorter list. And then I could um, ask myself, who are the um, authors working on, the most prolific authors working on uh, clusters of galaxies. And I can do that by, um, well, looking at the list on the left, but I 
I'm going to try to generate a, a co-authorship network taken from the um, top end papers uh, in this field. And as you can see, this uses a D3 visualization, and so it will start showing uh, different groups that have worked on, on the subject area. Um, and it's a little, as the um, plot moves, it's, it's difficult to see and appreciate the detail of it, but you can zoom in and out. Um, you can even search uh, within this uh, uh, graph. So I'm pretty sure Margaret Geller, who is our colleague at the CFA, has worked on it. And here she is. So I found her. I could select her, and I could select uh, John Hakra, our late uh, friend. Um, and as you can see, by selecting them, I'm, I'm building a list of people that I'm interested in, and then I can apply this as a filter on the list of results that I was working on. So I've used uh, another network to kind of explore the, the fields, the tech collaborations, and so forth. And then I made a selection on two of the scientists, and I created this additional filter uh, of my list. So you can see author, Geller, or Hakra. And here are the um, here's the list of their papers um, related to galaxy clusters or clusters of galaxies. Um, one more thing that I'd like to point out: if I go back to the original search, so we have um, uh, more than 9,000 papers uh, in the search. Um, I could ask myself, um, who are the most uh, prolific authors in this field? And I can see that. Uh, Beringer um, seems to, I think Hans is his name, seems to be the most um, uh, most prolific author in general. But maybe I'm, if I'm looking for experts, I may want to see first um, who is who are the authors of the most cited papers in the field. So if I resort this again, um, the list of facets will be the same because it's built on the entire set, um, and that's why uh, we introduced this option of sub-selecting the top papers on each topic. So having already sorted the papers by, um, by citations, I now ask the system to limit itself to the top 500 papers and to show me um, the facets based on that. So if I now take the top 500 papers on my subject, I can see that um, well, the most prolific author is not Beringer anymore, but it's uh, Simon White right here. Um, and um, I could ask the same question, but ask for a paper sorted by popularity. Um, so who are the top authors of the uh, top of the most popular papers on this subject? And uh, this usually points to people that are actively working in the field or who are writing the up-and-coming um, papers in a particular field. Um, Somebody asked today, uh, earlier today, um, about the impact of Galaxy Zoo, right? So I could say Galaxy Zoo, um, <laughs> or I think it would be Zoo Universe. Right? So let's see what happens here. Uh, so the Galaxy Zoo has, um, has uh, these many papers. Um, the, the top ones are uh, related to uh, Galaxy Zoo itself. Uh, I don't see Zoo Universe, but I'm sure it's somewhere in there. So um, it seems to be mentioned 198 uh, times. Um, if I search the full text, I, I'm going to find many more. OK, here we go. Uh, and what I could do now is um, apply one of our operators. I mentioned that um, we support uh, operators applied to any query. So I can now apply the, what we call the trending operators, which takes an input query and then shows papers related to this topic, which seem to be trending, so which are popular according to the readership that we have in our system. These are essentially papers that have been read by those who most often read papers on the original topic. So here I'm asking myself, what are popular papers amongst the readers of Galaxy Zoo papers? And boom, here we go. 
You see, a lot of them really are into Galaxy Zoom. <laughs> There's a lot of it. But you know, now this is just one component of the query. So um, I can then say, if I remove all papers about Galaxy Zoo from the trending paper of the original set, what other things are people um, reading? And uh, well, here it is. I don't know uh, how interesting of a list it is. Um, but it looks like it's people um, you know, who uh, may, be, uh, may be interested in planet hunting, um, redshift studies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, similarly, I could ask myself, um, <coughs> who are the people who, um, uh, what papers are the papers about Galaxy Zoo referencing? So, um, let's see, I go like this. I'm going to take all the papers about Galaxy Zoo and look at the references that uh, those papers contain. And we see that um, you know it contains a lot of references to people like Schneider, um, and so forth. Uh, well, maybe I don't want to. Um, I want to eliminate Schneider. Is he one of the main authors? No, he's not. Okay. Not as far as I know. Okay. Let's say I want to eliminate someone who is. Uh, Bob Nichol. Second one is. Uh, uh, Nichol. Okay. So if I wanted to remove him because I'm saying, okay, he's self citing himself, um, I could simply do this. Um, I remove the author from the list, and then uh, here I have all the references from the papers in Galaxy Zoo, except the ones that point to Nichol. Um, and similarly, I can uh, create a list of citations. So this is the cumulative list of um, citations of all papers that are about Galaxy Zoo or the, uni or the Zoo universe. Um, and again, you could um, do the same um, by uh, removing uh, papers that contain Galaxy uh, Zoo itself, if you wanted to. But my point here is that. Um, you see how this becomes a very flexible search engine. Uh, you're basically creating operators that can take as input queries, and therefore the entire set of papers that satisfy the queries. And then um, you can build out your query to be as complicated as you want. You can use Boolean opera operators, ands, nots, and so forth. You can limit your searches to the uh, done on the metadata or the full text. Um, you can remove. Uh, struct metadata and structured metadata. You can limit the search by publication here. Um, sky's the limit. Okay, so I think I made the point that I wanted to make so far. So let's get back to um, presentation. Right, don't forget the API. All this stuff is available through an API. Um, this is our GitHub page, um, and there's ADS apps dev API. Uh, I know some of you have used it already because um, this all happened Friday afternoon when um, a tweet from our colleague Dr. <laughs> said, hey, you know, ADS apps is all this new functionality. And um, Andy Casey, who, has, who I've never met, but he's obviously a bright young fellow, um, <laughs> at about um, 2 p.m. said, oh, yeah, they have an API. I'm going to try something out. Um, and um, what he did actually is um, he said he wrote a four-line Python script. Um, by the end of the day, he had made two visualizations of uh, his uh, papers and uh, the citations, you know, the people citing his papers, as well as the um, co-authorship network of the uh, pe people who cited him. So this personally made me quite happy um, <laughs> because this is exactly the kind of outcome that we were hoping for. Um, there's too, too much stuff for us to do. I mean, we want to do what we do best, which is provide a um, reliable service, keep ADS up to date, 
we will never have enough time and enough brains to do all the clever things with the data that you might think of. Um, so we want to really build this as a platform and then uh, let you guys play with, um, with what you may want to do. Um, and at the same time, and I hope to get to this in the next uh, 10 minutes, uh, we would love to be able to incorporate back any uh, contributions that you can make uh, to making ADS more awesome. And some of the examples are, OK, what Andy did is, is a great example of how you can do things quickly. Um, exam these are examples from a class that Chris Erdman um, head of the Center for Astrophysics for librarians, actually. He uh, trained a group of librarians in uh, data science. Um, and they came up with some cool ideas. Like this is a, a plot where um, Alex Holacek um, correlated the uh, likeliness that a figure of word would be more or less associated with a highly excited paper and built this plot. Um, then she analyzed how um, this is a visualization of the frequency uh, of the, um, uh, frequency of terms from the unified astronomy thesaurus in the highly cited papers, and it's an interactive uh, visualization. And this is work that uh, Luis and um, Luis Rubin, who's here, and her group did about again mining the DOE grants from the ADS full text. And then uh, they built some visualizations uh, based on it. And again, here's the URL if you want to go. There's a blog um, related to all these projects that you can read about. Last year, those of you who were at Dot Astronomy heard about the ADS All Sky Survey, which is a project about data mining, mining images in the historical literature in ADS, and um, uh, either astro tagging or uh, creating astrometric. Um, uh, solutions for them using uh, astrometry.net. Uh, so this is a project uh, by Alberto Pepe, Lisa Goodman, and Gus. And uh, there's an, now an actual website um, available for it. Um, or just you know talk to the three people in question um, to get an update on how that is working out. Um, this is another example to just show that you know we can go beyond the astronomy community. This is something Elsevier has recently done. They built what they called uh, an application in their platform, which is called um, uh, uh, Scopus, uh, where they, uh, using our API, they pull in content. Um, they find out whether a particular article has data associated with it um, by querying ADS, essentially. And then if it does, they end up linking to um, Simbad or NED and the ADS record um, just by pulling in some um, uh, an AJAX call into their web page. So what's the recipe that we're trying to um, encourage here and foster? Um, well, encourage people in our community and our collaborators um, to use our system, uh, give us feedback, and um, enrich our content. Uh, it can be as easy as providing a way for users to give us corrections um, or entering missing metadata. Um, we want to share. Uh, we want to share content and share services. So that's why we're, we're building APIs. Um, we also want to allow people to um, curate their own data set and then connect it back to the ADS data holdings. So we're you know, it's not our job to figure out what objects are mentioned in papers because Simbad and NAT do already an excellent job at it. So what we want to do is just enable that functionality in our search interface. Um, and then take advantage of the network effect. Uh, what we've been saying for a long time, linked resources are, are used resources. And the studies, the couple of studies that we've seen which prove just that, uh, one by uh, Rick White from a space telescope that shows that actually archival data in uh, in the mass um, database uh, now are um, are obtaining more citations. The papers associated with archival data in recent years have obtained more citations than uh, papers about new data from HSD. And we've also found a 20% advantage in citations for papers that have online data linked to it. So. Um, Everybody wins if uh, we provide these resources um, and uh, keep resources linked on the web. Okay, 
Um, what can we do better? Um, and by we, I'm talking about the art community a little more in general, not just ABS. Um, but if you think about it, a lot of the curation and a lot of the archives that we all use are, um, are, are part of a distributed network of resources. And people <coughs> spend time to actually go through the content and, and the, um, the content of papers and the information stored in papers to then create uh, curated databases. So Timber and Ned will uh, store information in their system that um, is of this sort. You know, uh, this paper talks about this particular cluster and it measured its redshift, and this is the redshift. Or the uh, Chandra archivists will uh, record the fact that a particular paper mentions um, a Chandra observation ID. Or a cataloger will say, um, will assign keywords to a particular paper. So all of this happens in a distributed fashion and in different archives. Um, the problem with this is that uh, none of, rarely this information is shared back. When it's shared back, it's usually at a very superficial level. So it's a link between one paper and one database um, entry, as opposed to a more rich uh, view of the paper that may contain contextual information about where um, this particular observation or object is mentioned, um, annotations or comments about that particular measurement. Um, we do our best to mediate this problem because we link to these archives. Um, but again, much of the context is lost in all of these translations. So to give you an idea, this is what this is the pipeline that Chris Erdman built when he worked at ESO to uh, support the bibliography that the ESO um, librarian does. Um, she's uh, Uta, who is the main um, head librarian there. She starts by searching the literature. She searches ADS. She uses a tool that allows her to <coughs> browse a list of recent papers, find mentions of instruments and um, uh, telescopes that uh, ESO has. Um, create a database where all of this information is kept and uh, annotated. Um, the, the librarian then verifies and validates that, in fact, uh, the information is about the particular telescope and um, which mode was the telescope used in, which instruments were used. All of that is saved in an internal ESO database, but all we get back is simply a list of bibliographic um, bib codes. So, we end up finding out from all of this activity at ESO that this particular paper has something to do with ESO data. But all the detail is, is lost as a, at a global level. You would have to go to ESO to find that out. Um, what, uh, ScienceWise was also mentioned. This is a website that allows automatic uh, extraction of topics for um, papers on archive and allows users to then refine that list of topics. So the idea there is that they um, maintain an ontology and build a system that allows users to kind of um, tag papers by scientific topics. But again, that information is not shared um, through a platform. It's just stored in their system. And finally, this, um, and again, I'm not, I'm not picking on these projects. I think they all do great things. But um, this is the part that. You know, when I saw it the first time, it made me cringe a bit because this is the, um, I, I think it's still accurate, it's the workflow that Simbad uses to uh, find objects in papers. And the work, workflow actually involves parsing the PDF um, document to find through a set of regular expression and heuristics all mentions of astronomical objects. Um, so the end of this process is actually an annotated document where you have um, links between object names and, and and then created against the Simbad database. So then the librarian validates this input and enters this information in the database. And the annotated uh, paper is simply it's, uh, thrown away because um, obviously being a copyrighted material, they can't be distributed further. So to make a long story short, um, as long as this level of curation happens in a um, closed environment, uh, all the work and all the um, knowledge that is accumulated is 
it's not thrown away, but it's not accessible by the um, by the scientists or, or the in an efficient way. It certainly cannot be shared at that richness level um, that the curator is seeing during this process. Um, how could this situation be improved? Uh, well, we need a system that allows people to actually conduct this activity and then um, saves all that information. Um, this could be done leveraging uh, annotations, which are a way to tag content um, available in, as a web resource and then keeping prominence of all the annotations made on it. So it would require a web-based platform, uh, discovery tools that allow you to search, uh, annotate things, um, APIs that allow uh, a certain level of automated searches and annotations out of the box, um, integration with authoring tools like Authoria um, that um, I bet Beth is involved in. Um, we are run, currently running an experiment uh, with been tasked with keeping a, a list of bibliography for NASA awards, so grants given out by NASA. And so we're using this as a test case to see how else, how well we can use our existing API and um, search capabilities to, um, to provide for this. So I believe our project can help, um, but it's you know certainly not uh, provide all the pieces that are needed to do what I just described. Um, how can we help? We actually have all the refereed literature. We have um, archive papers indexed in our system. Um, so we actually have the stream of characters that uh, are part of the full text. We can't redistribute it um, because much of it is copyrighted material. But um, much of the, many of the snippets, uh, as you can see when you run a search, are available to the end user. And so um, one, there is a possibility of actually annotating the results of a search if you have something that you are looking for. Um, we are also working on uh, an upgraded version of what we used to call the private libraries, which is a way to tag a list of papers. Um, and so here you can build your own uh, list of papers and concepts associated with it. And um, we are constantly working with librarians to make it easier for them to do their curation activities. Uh, so uh, all of the, the tagging that librarians might want to do can be then shared back to the public and increasing the search capabilities um, and the recall of this material. Um, what's the advantage for the curator? Well, as you've seen, it's trivial uh, to go from a list of papers to metrics related to that paper. So, you want to answer questions such as, what's the impact of Telescope X? Uh, one easy way to do it is to find the papers that um, contain data generated from the telescope and then get the metrics for those papers. Uh, want to help? I'm here um, the entire conference. And so if, uh, if you have ideas or, um, or if you have money, we could uh, <laughs> 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 For more information. So um, the platforms I described uh, is deployed still under ADS Labs. Eventually, it will have its own um, website. It, it will be what we call ADS 2.0 right now. Um, we listen to you. Um, anything you want to say, you could send it. Um, you could put it on Twitter, or that uh, we even have a Facebook page. Although. Most people seem to have these conversations in the astronomers group, so we also follow that. Um, we will um, actually establish the YouTube channel. There's not much there, but we'll populate it now that we have something to, um, to show and some tutorials to make. I mentioned the Git repository. And um, we're about to hire a developer, so if, um, I'm just saying. <laughs> Let me know. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. So the question was about the support of semantic search. Um, we do we do have like a lightweight 
uh, support for semantics in the sense that we use an extensive list of synonyms in our system. Um, uh, so you can type QSO, or you can type quasar, that quasars, that QSOs, you'll get the same results. Um, we don't yet have a full blown ontology um, to be able to really le leverage the, what, what people consider to be uh, fully semantic search. But um, one of an interesting project we're working on is this unified astronomy thesaurus, which is an authoritative list of concepts. And uh, what we're trying to do is, um, well, again, we could, as quickly as we can, but this is certainly uh, not something that we can deploy right now, is mine the literature looking for these concepts so that then you can do, um, uh, you know, start from a search uh, which is very broad and then narrow it down by uh, finding uh, sub concepts of the generic of a particular broad concept or vice versa. You expand your search based on this uh, knowledge base. So it's um, that's the extent of it. So it's uh, it will probably be something that trickles in unbeknownst to the user, and if we do it right, it means that it's probably not going to be noticed um, as a huge shift, but as just uh, an incremental improvement on search. Kevin, uh, so I'd be really interested to search uh, or to get a geographical. Um, picture of the of the author of the creation and I can search for it. <laughs> yeah, um, so you have the uh, I think creation does this work? Yeah. Uh, so Here's the thing about affiliation, and, and that's why I'm saying it's work in progress. Affiliations are very messy strings that came from the publisher. What we want to do is basically, and that's what requires work, is normalize them so that whether you type Center for Astrophysics, CFA, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, blah, 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 you obtain the same results. In fact, um, we're working on building a database where there is um, where there's a structure of it. So you can search things at an institute level as well as a department level. So you can search for papers published at Harvard as opposed to the Harvard College Observatory. Um, the, the current issue with this is that, again, it's not uh, normalized now. So you, you're not able to do it in a smart way. Um, ideally, what we would want to have is autocomplete so that when you start typing uh, CFA, you would see a pop-up that says Center for Astrophysics, and that's the canonical name, and you click on it, and boom, you get it all. Uh, it, it'll come. Yeah, and the same for country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, country, I mean, to the extent that country exists there, so if, if I look for things, um, problem with most countries is that often in, uh, in affiliations in the U.S., um, often the, the country is neglected, so it's easier to search for papers published by someone in a small country because they always put the country there. So again, it's it's just working with raw string as opposed to uh, a well-established database of affiliation. But yeah, Adam and Dan. So uh, first, a lot of us are signing up for API. <laughs> but uh, I also want to ask about the show very early on. Show that there were like 65,000 users regularly using the ADS, yeah. and that's way more than the number of professional astronomers. Do you have a sense of the rest are? Do most are? So, yeah, I, I mean, I think, well, first of all, a caveat 55,000 are regular users. To us, those are cookies, anonymous uh, cookies, right? So, you may have two cookies that have been used. I don't know. If, if you create an account and you log in, then it's you. But we don't require logging, so if you move from one institute to another or go home and um, versus work, so it could be a factor of two right there. Um, it's clear that we're used in um, researchers and physics use this. Um, many people working on uh, uh, engineers working in optics and stuff like that use ADS. Because 
is we, we have, for instance, indexed all of the SPIE um, publications. And some of those fields, it's actually, it, it may not be hard, but it may be expensive to use commercial databases. So they, they find us as a welcome source of information. Um, and then there's, um, there's certainly some people from the uh, general um, science education community. So uh, teacher, physics teachers, for instance, uh, come to us. Uh, we have a partnership with Compadre, which is um, an association by the American um, Association for Physics Teachers and the American Astronomical Society. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is. Uh, all really exciting. Um, I'm really stoked about this. And I, I signed up for the API ages ago and, and haven't played with it much recently. But when I signed up for it before, I asked about because um, the data seemed really stale. Oh, and okay. yeah. And, and when I asked about that, there were no guarantees about sort of how, what the sort of timeline for real time data yeah. would be. Okay. Right? Yeah, anyway. So this will change, right? But right now we have this weasel words at the bottom. <laughs> so weasel board, it basically means it's a warning because really what happens is the data, the bibliographic data is mostly up to date. It's usually one day, one day behind. The citation data is not up to date because traditionally maybe as plastic it was two separate parts of the system that had it. So that's why don't go yet here and try to do your metric analysis because you'll get some stale data. Um, I hope um, soon we'll be able to be up to date within a week. And then after that, there's some kinks that we need to work out. After that, it would be a daily kind of incremental thing. Can I just follow that up? Yeah. So just so then the, the so but something like having a listing for an archive paper would be the day after. So is there some sort of guarantee of, or is, is there um, about <laughs> suggested or something like that somewhere? Uh, so is there a guarantee? No, because stuff still breaks or updates don't still don't go through. You know, it's, um, I'm giving you an average, but to to be totally frank. Um, in AES Classic, updates from archive on a daily basis. But every other month, uh, there'll be one day where their OAI server doesn't respond, and so we miss the update. So it's just more reliable, but still, it, nothing is perfect, right? Um, so use this as a playground, um, but don't use the, you know, the results of it as, as truth. Um, yeah. I'm right. going to Jonathan. And then okay. on um, two questions ago, one of the questions was asked that where do these people come from if they're not astronomy researchers? We have uh, WWT has deep links. Any object has an ABS link directly mm -hmm. to it. So I'm sure oh, we yeah. send our fair share of, uh, of noise to your server as well. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, I mean, that's why we have, if you look at the total number of unique users, it's 10 million. And those, the greatest majority of those are people who go to Google, find something, come to ADS, or maybe from WWT. So um, the the regular users are ones that uh, use ADS, um, at least run 10 searches per month. So you know those are people actually searching the literature on a website as opposed to coming in. So most of the WWT is in the 10 million or the other uh, number I had there, which is um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we divide people by uh, usage to differentiate the core users from. Was another question? Yeah. So this, this is something that I think has actually changed uh, by the way people choose to publish. That, um, you and also ISI make a distinction between review. So if I'm offered an opportunity to write a chapter in the book, I look and say, well, I can do that with a lot of work from the paper, but it's not going to come from my citations, it's not going to come from my agency, because it's not being, uh, it's not popping up from these papers. And I'm wondering how challenging it would be to create another category. 
category for this is scientific level book. And it probably isn't too hard to find that classes uh, such that you can click on review, review plus books, not review. It's treated as an additional category, both in what you get for hits and what you count for citations. Okay, so the question was about reviews and the counting of citation. So AES does not really distinguish between reviews and non-reviews. ISI does, um, but we don't. Uh, the only distinction we make is referee versus non-referee. Um, if you take the H number that we give you, that includes all your papers, the citations, all your papers, whether they were reviews or not. Uh, in terms of, I mean, I believe most reviews that I've seen are published in the referee literature, whether it's it's a review. Things like the GDS, uh, the Arizona Press series, and Time for Science, uh, the various Cambridge series, where, where you basically have a book consisting of articles. Yeah. On some topic. And uh, very, very the, highly the only, the only case where you would be somewhat punished is if that's not considered a referee book. But we have the notion of articles being refereed even if they're published in the book. Did you see something that suggested that we? I didn't. I didn't see my article. Uh, <laughs> I don't ever. When I when I click on the tweet. Okay. That maybe if you show me, it may be just a matter that it was incorrectly classified as not referee. But uh, we're not trying. we we like people who write reviews. It creates a nice web of um, and and uh, holistic view of a topic. In fact, there's a, a function in in the there's this operator, um, instructive, that basically finds reviews on a topic. Um, and I could say, um, it uses the citation network to find uh, papers that have a lot of citations to the papers of your topic of interest. So review papers do exactly that. They cite a lot of papers on a topic because they're trying to give um, so sometimes this works well, sometimes it doesn't. But um, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I think thank you. That was really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So that's it for today. Um, thank you all for coming and for being here. It's quite a long day in the end. Everyone's saying it's the same, very civilized start, but it's. Yeah. 6.30, so thank you for sticking around for all of this. It's been a lot of fun. Um, thank you to our speakers, uh, but also to Jose, Dave, and Chris, who have been sat at the back trying to get the internet to work properly with all of this. And uh, Brooke live blog this morning on the on .com, so thank you for that. And Elizabeth and Nathan, the Asher Bites guys, have been doing Storify, which is good. Uh, it's all been fun. Um, keep using Twitter and email. To keep chatting and drinking and running, as at least some people are tomorrow. Um, and we'll see you again at 9.45 to start. And I think there are refreshments again in the morning before that. So thank you very much, and see you tomorrow. Are there shuttles you? I have no idea. There yes. are no shuttles you There are no shuttles you It's a lot of luck. Someone call it a hub to meet in on Twitter. <laughs> and. Whoever that was, you just want to say the name of the pub? Mm -hmm. Someone call that a pub. Kendall. That was it. So it's a Kendall Square, so that's probably where most of us are going. And if you want a print copy of the schedule, I don't know who you are. <laughs>